You guys can hear me all right? Audio good? Good, good, good. Okay, I'm so glad to be here today. I'm just thrilled. Um, you guys are awesome. The things you're doing are awesome. I love that, that introduction because it talks about that challenge of going from no to maybe to probably. Let's get to definitely and we'll work together on that. Uh, so yeah, I, I work for, for Canvas by Instructure. I've been with Instructure just over six years now. So for a young company, I'm an old timer. Uh, but prior to that, I worked in distance education for pretty much my entire career. And my first job in distance ed had me driving around the state of Utah and into some, some remote places much like this. So this was about, oh, I don't actually want to say how long ago it was, but I carried a pager instead of a cell phone at that time. <laughs> and, and my job was to go around to these very remote locations throughout the state and maintain computers that we had kind of hacked together to do kind of pre-video conferencing, like pre-webcam stuff. And so I would drive, you know, hundreds of hundreds of miles to get to these remote locations to make sure that the equipment was ready to go before the live class time. And I remember going out uh, to one of these locations uh, far in eastern Utah, probably about uh, 160 miles away from Salt Lake City. And I had been working on the computer right before the class was about to start. And, uh, and I thought, okay, this will be interesting. I'll, I'll see the students actually experience the class instead of just looking at the technology. And uh, a student came in and sat down and, and I waited and, and that was pretty much it. There was just one student and the class started and the whole session went on. And I asked her, are, are you the only student at this location? And she said, yeah, yeah, I am. So on my drive back to, to Logan, in the north, I thought, you know what, that seems like a lot of time on my part and a lot of money on the part of the university just to support that one student in that one location. So um, being a little naive, when I got back to my office, I told my boss, hey, maybe we just get rid of that location because we're only going to lose like one student. And he said, how long have you been working for me? Because I think you don't understand what's going on here. And he kind of walked me through a way of thinking about my purpose, the reason I was out there and the reason that we had spent time and money and effort getting that far. And, and I analogize this to a technique called the five whys that was developed by uh, Sakichi Toyota. Yeah, that Toyota. And it was originally developed to kind of help diagnose problems with the system. But, but we use it to identify the underlying reason why we're actually doing what we do. And so in this particular case, he said, so, you know, wh why were you out there? And the first answer was, well, I'm there to maintain that remote classroom technology. Well, why are you doing that? So students, or in this case, one student, can take courses at a distance. Okay, why? Well, in this case, that student was certifying to teach special education. She was already a classroom teacher. She was certifying to teach special education. Oh, okay. Why is that important? Well, she's going to help students who need it most. And not just one or two students, but dozens of students year after year. And what he taught me in that moment was that students who we train in the field at their regional location are more likely to stay in their schools and therefore persist and help more students over time. So ultimately, the last answer to the question why is we do this so all, all people, all students, can fulfill their potential. And so walking through that exercise for me, with the time, you know, undergrad student, a, a little bit naive about the world, it really helped me appreciate not just what we were doing, but what I was doing with those little things out in the field. So we do this with Canvas as well, and um, we'll, we'll talk through this a little bit. We'll talk through the five whys. If I were to ask you, uh, why Canvas? Why choose or use Canvas, what would you say? Anybody? Why Canvas? And I'll repeat it. I can hear, so. There's a remote group? Okay. Um, so we actually had criteria. So your uptime was 99.95%. Okay. Your mobile application was one of the best rated. Yeah. Um, you were cost affordable. You had an open architecture, so you could integrate a lot of stuff in, and we liked your UX. Right on. 
So a, a, a lot of great reasons. Thank you. That's right. Come uh, on. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what we, I, I love it. Thank you. Like that was better than I would have delivered it. So I'll, I'll tell you what we say in our marketing pitch. We say that Canvas makes teaching and learning easier. That's our underlying goal. Uh, why do we care about that? Why do we care about technology to make teaching and learning easier? Anybody want to venture an answer? There's no right or wrong answers. I mean, I have it laid out one way. Yeah. Right on. Yeah, makes it accessible to more people. Um, oftentimes we look at it as increasing adoption of technology uh, by teachers, by faculty, uh, even by students. Well, why do we care about that? Well, one reason, and this is really prevalent in institutions where the LMS is optional, is because students want teachers to use it. Well, if we ask ourselves, why do students want teachers to use it, uh, even beyond access to online courses, there's some really simple reasons. As I talk to students, they, they talk about things like, it makes my teachers more organized, it gives me flexibility, it allows me to engage differently. And so why do those things matter? I'll leave this one to you. Why does it matter if technology helps students be more organized or gives them flexibility or helps them engage differently? Why does that matter? More likely to graduate. I love it. So broadly speaking, we can say that that allows us to create opportunities for success for all students or for more students. And, and so that idea of student success, even though it's something that we often talk about at an institution level, we talk about it in terms of the student life cycle from trying to get them in the door and making sure they have enough resources and they're guided on a pathway to the actual learning experience, the engagement in the institution, to completion, to graduation, and now more than ever, I think we're talking about post-graduation success, right? We think about student success from this big picture view more often than not, but it's sometimes difficult to think about how we who work with students day to day, whether in the classroom or as their, their support staff, um, affect student success, but there's, some really good evidence that we can. And so I want to spend the next 30, 40 minutes uh, focusing on that part of student success, that engagement, and how we can enhance it. So you don't have to go very far into the research literature to see that student engagement correlates really strongly with completion and with GPA. So students, uh, my fonts are a little screwed up. Sorry, guys. So students um, who report that they feel engaged in their institution or in their classes are one and a half times more likely to complete, whereas students who report feeling disengaged take on average an extra semester to graduate if they graduate at all. And uh, that, one, that one study, which looked at freshman students in college courses, uh, actually found that a student's level of engagement in a single course can predict their degree attainment. Now, we don't know exactly why that is from that study, but there are other studies that we can look at, uh, one of which shows that learning gains realized by students during a year uh, with an effective teacher were sustained over later years. And that kind of reinforces what we've seen um, in other research that suggests that a student's sense of engagement builds over time. If you start out with a high level of engagement, that's going to increase. But if you start out kind of disaffected or disengaged, that feeling is going to increase too. And so it suggests that there's this cycle uh, that we can either enhance and reinforce, or if it's a disengagement cycle, we need to break. Now, that, that idea kind of makes sense if you think about what happens in a typical classroom. Uh, you know, this is the primary school, elementary school kid. I'm sure you all remember her. She was in your class, right? Or maybe you were that. You were that student. Uh, students who are engaged in the moment, they're the ones who raise their hand and get the attention of the teacher. And the teacher rewards or reinforces that sense of engagement. Whereas the students who are quiet, they may not get that attention, but it might be attention that they need. And so I know a lot of us as teachers do reach out to those students who are disengaged, um, but we want to be careful in how we do that so that we don't feel like, or they don't feel like we're being overbearing with them. So where do we go with this idea of this cycle of engagement? Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we think about Canvas and its role in facilitating students' participation and in 
ensuring that they have an understanding and the capability to progress in their learning. Uh, and then also that they are motivated, that we both understand their level of motivation and we find ways to enhance that motivation. These things seem to work as a cycle, at least as far as the research shows. And it's not that you have to start at any one point. You can actually start by focusing on any of these three points. And we're going to start here by looking at participation. How can we increase student participation? And as we go through this, uh, I'm going to talk about some ways that we've seen teachers use Canvas for these ends, and also talk about some things that are either pretty new in Canvas or just about to be released. So when we talk about uh, student participation in a face-to-face -face classroom, teachers usually mean, how do I get students to participate in my discussion? And as you can see in this picture, all the students are totally engaged. They're ready to participate in the discussion. Uh, if you can't see the screen, they're all looking at, you know, Facebook or videos or who knows what, playing games. Yeah, like consistently. <laughs> all right. Uh, one and a half seconds. This is about how long the average teacher waits after they ask the class a question before calling on somebody or answering it themselves. Uh, some research that has been repeatedly uh, tested shows that just by waiting a little bit longer, by waiting three seconds instead of one and a half, you can increase the quality and the uh, diversity of participation among students. So can we just pause for a moment and count to three silently and feel how long that is? Okay, it feels kind of long. And I know when I'm standing up here, I always count too fast. But it feels long. It's one of those little things, though, that we can do. It pushes us outside of our comfort zone, and it increases participation. Um, but we're talking about online here. And really, one of the big benefits of an online discussion is that when you ask a question, you don't have that time limitation. And you don't have the time limitation on students as well to think of an idea to consult whatever it happens to be in front of them and to come up with their answer. You can extend that discussion over a period of time, allowing or even requiring all students to participate and giving them access to more resources and materials with which to compose their answer. So that's kind of a no brainer with online participation. Um, a lot of times though, we're looking for ways to increase or change the quality or the quantity of participation in online discussions. And we could talk about this um, for, out, for hours, I'm sure. But there's one thing that we found, that my research team found when we looked at Canvas usage data in terms of uh, increasing discussions. So when we looked at how discussions and content and materials were used throughout all of Canvas, we found this really interesting uh, correlation that discussion posts, whether that's the original post or a reply, that contains a video has an 11.5% greater reply rate. Students are more likely to reply to a post when it has video in it. Okay, so we don't know why, but we actually have some anecdotes that maybe help us arrive at that point. Uh, Brigham Young University Hawaii has a global online program where uh, it's 100% online. And one of the things that they do in some of their courses is require students to actually record themselves in video in discussion forums. And that might be just for the introduction where we're building that sense of classroom community. It might be in other discussions as well where it's important to remind folks that we're all human and we all have personalities. And they found that this is particularly helpful for international or global students um, because students need to kind of have that chance to compose themselves, to express themselves in oral English as opposed to just written um, and you know, to, to redo it if they want to. So Michael Griffiths, one of the instructors who first brought this to our attention, says that students reported feeling more connected and involved in the online class than even in the face-to-face -face class when video was, pre was present. Uh, when we asked one of the leaders about this, he says that the, the video in discussions allows students who wouldn't normally participate in a class discussion to express themselves in a less intimidating environment. I'm sure as you guys can imagine or, or can see, it certainly creates a different sense of the person when you see them and you hear their voice. So let's talk about um, a really simple thing that you can do as well to increase or encourage participation with content. 
Uh, this is the Canvas Rich Editor. I think right here, yeah, I'm in the announcements, but anytime you're using the Rich Editor, I hope you guys all know that on the right-hand side, you have access to all of the parts of the course so that you can insert hyperlinks. So if you're talking about an assignment that happened last week or is coming up, you should hyperlink to it. If you're referencing part of a lesson, you should hyperlink to it. If you're talking about as you announced last week, you should hyperlink to it because it encourages students to not only understand the relationship between the different activities or content, but also to go back and review those things and make sure they understand what's going on. Very small thing that, that you can do to encourage participation with content. Another way to um, address participation is through accessibility. Now, I know those of you who are designing courses are certainly very, very aware of the fact that all content has to be accessible to students with disabilities. Uh, we've just released this accessibility checker in Canvas. It's right there in the rich content editor. And it helps you know if there are any content accessibility issues in what you have just composed. Now, what's cool about this is it's not just for course designers. It's for anybody who is putting anything into Canvas through the rich editor. If you're a teacher or if you're a student, you can do that kind of quick check to see you know, if there are any images that maybe don't have an alt attribute or if any of the font colors that you may have um, creatively chosen to use aren't high enough contrast. So this is, this is just released. This is, one, again, one of those little things that we can do to potentially increase participation. All right, let's move on to progress. Um, I had a professor who told me something that I remember to this day, and he said that I can't actually teach you anything. All I can do is open doors. And that's one of those things that, as an educator myself, makes me think, okay, that's nice, um, but you know, how, do, how do I encourage students to go through those doors? How do I motivate them to go through those doors? And, and also, are there any things that I'm doing myself to impede students' uh, ability to go through those doors? So here, hey, here's a quiz question for you. Uh, what's the number one reason that students drop online courses? This is just from one study. So there's actually several reasons, but number one reason, what do you guys think? B, time commitments. Yes, it is time commitments, which is an interesting thing to think about. Uh, for a lot of students who take online courses, they have full and busy lives. And so there's some conflict potentially. Uh, one of the things though, that is interesting to think about is in general, um, you know, these researchers, Babcock and Marx have looked at the amount of time that students study on average uh, week by week and have found that consistently that's been going down over time. The amount of time that students spend studying goes down over time. Now these, these two things aren't necessarily in conflict. They're probably both true, right? That time commitments and the pressure that we feel that we have uh, certainly limits the amount of time that we might be willing to put into our education. But for me as a technologist and somebody who's thinking about how do we conquer these challenges? It's an it's a, it's a issue of time management. And so there are things that we can do with technology to remove barriers or facilitate time management. And one of those things we're working on right now, you may have seen designs for this already, but it's an easier navigational dashboard for students. It's a new way for students to look at all of their courses chronologically, requirement by requirement, so that at a glance they can more easily see those things that they're responsible for and things that they may have missed. Uh, something else we're working on too. Oh, no, oh, there it is. Uh, is our Canvas skill for, for Alexa. So Alexa is the Amazon voice service that works on the Echo Dot and uh, you know, the Echo and the View and all these other things, even on apps now. And it's one of many voice services like Google Home or Siri. Uh, but it's the first one that we, we have actually started working on. And we have a skill in the Alexa store uh, primarily aimed at students. So students can just, you know, install the skill and then ask Alexa, you know, are there any new announcements? Do I have anything missing? What's due tomorrow? What's due next week? And Alexa talking to Canvas will tell the student there are no new announcements or there are three new announcements and give the titles of them or, you know, here's what's due tomorrow. And this is a way that we think we can lower the barrier for students to stay informed about their courses. Because you know, in this world of continuous connectivity where we're bombarded with information, 
um, we need as many gateways to that information as we can. And for students to not have to log in, to not have to even open the mobile app, but simply to be able to ask in their homes, you know, what's due tomorrow, what a great way for them to stay on top of and know when they need to participate. And we're working on some things for teachers too. For example, you know, how many assignments do I need to grade so I can plan my weekend better? Uh, this is something that's in the research phase. So this is not built, right? This does not have a timeline associated with it. We're researching this. Are there ways that beyond inviting students to ask about what's happening in their course that we can nudge students in the moment, depending on their own personal behavior. So if I'm the kind of student, okay, I was this kind of student, who tends to turn stuff in late or at the last minute, uh, Canvas should know that. And Canvas should give me a nudge, maybe the morning that an assignment is due, to say, hey, you may want to turn this assignment in, it's coming up right at midnight. Okay. On the other hand, if I always turn stuff in early, I shouldn't get a nudge. Canvas should know that and let me go about my merry business. Uh, alternatively, we can look at things like if a discussion forum needs more interaction, if, if students posts are not getting enough attention, maybe nudge to join in. Or if you're the kind of person that ignores or, or tells us directly that you hate nudges, uh, we should not nudge you anymore. So there's this fine line between nagging and actually helping you overcome your own personal um, you know, I don't want to say deficiencies, but challenges. We all have strengths and weaknesses, and mine's turning stuff in on time. So this is something that's in the research phase now, but we're getting a lot of positive feedback, and uh, we actually have a proof of concept that's uh, being used by some teachers today. All right, one of the things that I think both of those, or especially nudges, but, I, but you know, both of those ideas can help students understand is that um, it's not you know, learning and, and succeeding is not binary. It's not black or white. You're not either smart or dumb. It takes work and there's a lot of activities that result in your success. And I think this is one of our, our jobs as a teacher is not just to help students learn how to learn, but to help them anticipate that it's not going to necessarily be a smooth and easy path. And there's going to be dips and valleys and there's going to be ups and downs over time. And one really simple way that's already part of Canvas um, you know, it's called the what if scores. And to be honest, when we first designed this, this was one of the very first features of Canvas, it was based upon teachers actually telling us, um, I'm tired of students asking me, well, what if I get an A minus on the midterm as opposed to, you know, a B plus, what's that going to do for my final grade? So Canvas has this way for students to go into their grades and for any particular assignment say, what if I got a 13 out of 15? or a 10 out of 15, right? And this might seem like a tool whereby students figure out the exact number of points that they need to get by. But I would challenge you to think about it more as um, a tool that you can use to help students plan and to help students understand the requirements of your course. So I've seen a lot of teachers do this. The first day or the first week of class, they invite the students to do what if scores for all of their assignments? Because Canvas is going to calculate that final grade automatically. And if you have your formula set up right, it's going to work really smoothly. So what if you said to students, hey, go into the grade center, fill out all of your what if scores, and thereby not only understand how you might do this semester, because you probably have a pretty good sense of whether you're going to get a lot of A's or a lot of B minuses, uh, but also to understand how that final grade is going to be calculated so that if things don't look right in your mind, if the scores that you're giving yourself for these assignments don't add up to the grade you want, you can adjust your strategy. And here on the screen, I'm showing how uh, you can actually hyperlink to grades too. Again, using that hyperlink function, just drag that grades thing into your rich editor and make it that much easier for students to do what you're asking them to do. Here's a new thing uh, that is coming very, very soon actually a little bit delayed, which is embarrassing, but it's going to be worth it. Uh, this is Analytics 2. Now, Canvas has analytics dashboards for students and teachers today, uh, but they're not as good as they could be. They don't go very deep, and they're not terribly actionable. So this is something that um, we're working on is about to be released, and the first visualizations that we've focused on 
are really for performance, for student performance in class. And what you're looking at right now is the average grade for all students within the course. And the, the columns here with the little icons represent those assignments. And what's cool here is that this allows you to drill down and go deeper and also segment students to understand performance. So, you know, clicking on one of those little items will give you some detail on student performance within that activity or assignment, which is great. But you'll notice that um, the items within are also clickable. So if there are 11 late submissions on this assignment, clicking on that will let you see the students who turned those in late, what their score was, and then you'll notice there at the top the ability to message those students. This is just like we have in the grade book today, message students who didn't turn it in, received less than, more than, whatever, but now we've got this coming in analytics with a lot more variables for you to control. And so you can reach out to those students. That's really our goal with analytics in general, is to give you an understanding, but also prompt you to take action based on it. And some cool filtering is being put in so that you can put things side by side, like section one or group one versus group two, uh, and then even pull out individual students just by typing in their name. And then of course, drill in, get some more detail on that student or that group of students or that section uh, and take action. So that's what we're building right now. It'll be out next quarter. That's the teacher view. Uh, but more importantly, actually, to me, is the student view. So that we can encourage students to ask themselves not just how do you learn, but also how do you as an individual learn. And this is kind of an emerging field of research, both analytics and student facing analytics. But there's some indication that getting students to use analytics to both understand their past participation and how that relates to performance uh, is both impactful on their motivation and impactful on their ability to progress and perform in the class. And when we talk about student-centered learning, I think this is actually what we're aiming at. When we say student-centered learning, it's not just us addressing individual needs of students, it's us helping students become self-directed lifelong learners. So that's what we'll be doing with the, the student dashboard in Canvas. We're hopeful that that's one of those things that will help increase student motivation. Motivation is a tricky thing, though. Sometimes we think about intrinsic motivation. We think, you know, students either have it or they don't, and there's nothing we can do about it. Well, we already know that there are things we can do with extrinsic motivation. And so we'll talk about some of those and a little bit about intrinsic as well. Oh, another quiz question. Oh, what's most important to students? Is it that instructors are responsive to my needs? Is it that instructors provide timely feedback? Is it that I have frequent interactions with my instructor? Or is it that instructors care about me as a person? Gosh, look at all those great things. I'm hearing, I'm hearing a few different answers from the audience, which is actually good because they're kind of all similar. <laughs> so there's, there, there are a couple of studies that I pulled, um, that I pulled this from. Uh, one of them lists those top three as really similarly high importance to students when they think about whether or not they should drop a course and whether or not they complete the course, these are equally high. All right, instructors are responsive to my needs. They provide me timely feedback, frequent interactions. This third one, instructors care about me as a person. This comes from a Gallup Purdue study where they looked at college graduates and measured their sense of well-being and correlated that with things that they believed about their school statements that they agreed with. And one of those most predictive statements was, I had an instructor who cared about me as a person. Yeah. I'll tell you a little story, which probably doesn't apply. But every time I go to a college or university that's using Canvas, um, I love talking to teachers. I love talking to staff. But I really try to reach out and find some students that I can talk to. Uh, this is Autumn Barney. She is an Air Force veteran. She's a single mom. She's a full-time student. She wrote uh, an article in her student newspaper. She was praising Canvas, which was great. But she was also complaining that one of her professors didn't use Canvas, and she thought it should be required. Now, again, this may not apply here so much. But here's what she said about that experience. Um, it was incredibly frustrating. I was constantly asking, hey, what did I get on this paper? What did I get on this assignment? 
And these are common student questions, but her expectations had been set by the teachers who were using Canvas and, and using it really effectively. And he was like, oh, let me check it. I'll email you. He would either take like a week or just take forever. Uh, that was that class was the only class I've ever gotten a B in. So Autumn's this highly motivated student, right? What we'd call a non-traditional student, uh, and her efforts to make progress, despite her motivation, were thwarted just by the simple fact. I don't want to say thwarted, but hindered perhaps by the simple fact that one of her instructors was not giving her the kind of timely feedback on her work that she wanted, she expected. Uh, she, she kind of concluded by saying, if students don't know where they're at, they can't focus in on where they need to focus. And again, that reminds me that, yeah, our job in part is to help students develop for themselves this self-direction, this motivation to learn and to regulate their own progress. But they need some information, they need some scaffolding along the way. This is not you guys. I've never been this teacher. Oh, well, maybe once, maybe once. <laughs> This is a problem, though. I mean, this is the sort of problem that uh, we as technologists look at with sympathy and say, how can we help solve this? How can we help solve this? Well, we want to design the technology to encourage people to use more and more of it, to use it in ways that are really, really effective. And I think we've done that in a number of places, but there are more ways we can do this. And one of the ways that we're working on this right now, this is actually just went into beta. We're calling it the new gradebook. We won't call it the new gradebook for, for long. We'll, it'll soon just be the regular gradebook. Um, but it's fundamentally easier to use. The thing you're seeing here on the screen is what we call the crosshairs, which follow you around as you work through the gradebook. It's a little thing, but people love it. Like it helps them understand more quickly and clearly exactly what cell they're about to edit. And it allows you to make faster adjustments, especially bulk adjustments. So this is the bulk grade adjustment where you want to say, actually, I'm going to give all students the same grade, or I'm going to add or subtract points from all of the students and ignoring the unsubmitted or ignoring the zeros, or here, a, a different way to curve grades on an assignment. And then finally, really, um, really a hot request here is better sorting and filtering in the gradebook, not just by student name, not just by assignment, but even by group or by section. So those are some things that are coming in the new gradebook that we think will both entice faculty to use it more, lower that barrier, and, and help them give more feedback uh, on time. And then, of course, the, the new teacher app for iOS and Android, where we're really just trying to uh, give you all the information that you need on your students, on their assignments, uh, so that you can see what needs grading, and then go right in and, and take care of it there. Um, so which, which reminds me of a little practice that I saw a teacher do once. Small thing, maybe some of you do this. Do any of you guys take really good student work and then share it back to the class to see? No? So this is called the work of the week, at least as that teacher explained it to me. And it's really simple. After you've assessed student assignments or papers or activities, and you, you find one that really stands out, that really illustrates the point of the assessment or the thing that you are trying to teach, uh, ask the student if you can share that with the rest of the class, and then just use an announcement to share it. Right? You download the file and post it in the announcement and you're done. And if you do projects really regularly or papers regularly, you can create this habit and this ideal in students' minds that, oh, geez, yeah, if, if, if I want to be the work of the week, if, my work wants, if I want my work to be showcased, um, I'm going to pay close attention to what the requirements are and use these examples as models for my future work. So it's kind of an extrinsic motivator, uh, but that doesn't mean it's bad. Extrinsic motivators aren't bad. They're real. They work. Uh, but we do, we, we do want to work. <laughs> took you a moment. <laughs> but, but we do want to um, work towards increasing intrinsic motivation as well. And I talked about student-facing analytics as one of those things, potentially. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think some of these other ways of kind of prompting students to understand their own behavior and how they can change that to improve their, their learning and to kind of give them that sense of autonomy and power that disengaged students tend not to have. We want to find those ways if we want to increase intrinsic motivation. And I think about it ultimately similarly to how John Hattie defines visible learning. He says that our goal as educators should be to create 
visible learning, where teachers see learning through the eyes of their students, Oops. and students see themselves as their own teachers. So it's not one or the other, it's a, it's a two-way street sort of thing. And so we're always looking for ways that we can do that in Canvas. And we're looking for cool practices that help with that as well. Um, one thing that, another one last little thing that I've seen teachers do that's super cool to me. Uh, this is showing it in an assignment. You can do this anytime you're talking to students about assignments, about the course in general. Uh, ask them to question the assignment. Ask them with every assignment, with every requirement, to question it, to say, why am I doing this? And if you don't have a good answer for why they're doing it, there might be a problem with the activity. But by encouraging students to ask that question, you're asking them to grant that assignment, that activity, some meaning that it may not have otherwise had. If they are able to put themselves in your shoes and say, oh, this assignment's got to be important for some reason, it's important because that understanding is going to help me be faster on my feet when I'm in a meeting, or that skill is going to help me be more competent, or you know, that's going to make me look better because this project is going to show well on my resume. Right? Ask them to question these assignments and activities so that they begin to give meaning to the work themselves. So that they begin to think, oh, there's a good reason why we're doing this. It's not just about the grade. It's not just about the score. It's not even just about the degree or the, the certificate at the end, um, it's about something that matters to me. So th those are my ideas uh, and ideas of others that I've collected and reused and abused probably uh, on how we not only can help students enter that cycle of engagement through participation, through progression, through motivation, but also stay in that cycle and reinforce that cycle because it can be self-perpetuating. One last thing that I want to show you guys that's coming soon. It's kind of boring, except that I think it'll empower a lot of you guys. Uh, role permissions in Canvas today are super bulky. It's either on or it's off. But we've just released the new designs for granular role permissions. And this is something that your staff and administrators and the designers will have to think about. But we're hopeful that this is a way of going from probably maybe to probably and hopefully toward definitely in terms of um, giving you exactly the capabilities that you want in Canvas to do what you need to do and make it a better student experience for everybody. This is out at studio.instructure.com. I don't know if you guys are aware of this. We take input for Canvas development in a lot of different ways. One of those ways is through our open community where teachers say, hey, I love this part of Canvas. Can you do that somewhere else? Or, hey, I really hate this part of Canvas. Will you change it? Or, hey, I have this great idea. Or, hey, I have this terrible idea. Oh, no terrible ideas. But it's an open forum for sharing. And it's also where our product managers and developers talk about big projects that we're working on, like granular permissions, like Analytics 2. And we show the designs, and we ask for feedback, and we organize focus groups. Right here, for example, you can see the real designs and click through them for the granular permissions. Same thing for Analytics 2 and new quizzes and all the big stuff we're working on. Go check it out. Go participate. Because for me, on the one hand, I think about the little things that you all can do that make a difference in, in students' lives and how we can use technology to make that possible. Um, I also want to think, though, and I, and I do every day, about the things that we can do differently to help you get students more engaged. So that's the challenge question I leave you with. It's two-way, like everything else. What's the one thing you can do differently to help students engage? And what's the one thing we can do with technology to help students engage? Thank you very much. <laughs> questions, yeah, we have time for questions. Yeah. Thank you uh, so much, and I, I couldn't help but think about, um, are you doing anything with gaming in the future? Mm. Are we doing anything with gaming? Uh, we are, well, in the future, I can't answer, maybe, maybe. 
Um, right now, we're not doing anything with gaming uh, because as we've talked with, with designers and teachers who want to do gaming, um, they tend to have very specific directions in terms of the games that they create. Now, if we can think of ways that the system itself in sort of broad ways is more gamified or has attributes that support gamification, we would love to do some of that. Did you have any specific ideas around game, gaming or gamification that you were thinking about? Well, I, I love playing, um, uh, you know, different games. And I just was curious if in yeah. terms of your research and what you've done of bringing that into the yeah. Canvas classroom. Yeah, so there's a, there's a, when, when I've looked at gaming in the past, there's a few things that really stand out. Uh, one is if you've played any modern video game, uh, you know that games are really excellent at both immersing you in a new world immediately, but also scaffolding you so that very quickly you learn how the game works and you are totally competent going off and exploring on your own. Like in that first five minutes, they build you up. They teach you how to play the game so that afterwards you're totally self-sufficient. And I love that. And I think there are things that we can do in Canvas for all users to kind of replicate that model. But that's a little bit less about learning. I think that's something that has to be in the course design. The other part of gaming that's, um, I think, super impactful and relevant for learning uh, is feedback, right? Like games give you instantaneous feedback, which is good for learning how the system works, good for learning how you need to adjust yourself. And, and I think to that end, I mean, if you kind of broaden it, then definitely we're working on some of those capabilities. Um, but, you know, as far as creating tools to organize games, we're not really working on anything right there. I think we would more, more, more often look at partners. Yeah. Question over here. Uh, in the presentation, you, you referenced uh, integration with um, Alexa. Yeah. Uh, do you guys have anything, any plans for uh, AI or bots inside yeah. Canvas? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you probably won't notice them, though. Nudge is an example. So uh, Alexa, the integration with Alexa is a is a illustration of us integrating with somebody else's artificial intelligence. And there's actually another place we do that as well. Um, our Arc video platform integrates with an artificial intelligence called Speechmatics, which converts spoken words to captions and video, right? Um, and we don't think about that as artificial intelligence. It's, it's really more just like advanced machine learning. But it's those sort of things like that, like Alexa, like Nudge, uh, which will be behind the scenes and will help people in little ways. But I don't know necessarily need to be called out as artificial intelligence. Um, we're not really thinking about uh, artificial intelligence in terms of an artificial tutor. We're certainly watching that and seeing how people work with adaptive learning to get there. But uh, we think that's probably a little further out and that there are companies better equipped to do that well than us. Um, Jared, first of all, it was a great presentation. Um, really relevant and engaging. Um, you know, you guys are, are growing and you have access to just, you know, thousands and hundreds of thousands of students online. Have you ever thought about putting together like maybe you have and I just don't know about it, but like a consortium of people to really go out and trial, try out um, different like scaled research yeah. of similar areas and like sharing the findings and like starting to create this like really amazing hub of what works and what doesn't? Mm -hmm. I, I love the idea. Um, the only group of institutions that has gotten close to that is that group of research universities called Unison. They said they came together with that as one of their stated goals is to benefit from both their shared intellectual capital, but also their shared data. Um, they've had some challenges in ter terms of data governance, but you know, yeah, oftentimes what folks say or say to us when they're data minded is that hey, you're sitting on this gold mine of data, why don't you do more with it? Well, partly because we have self-restricted ourselves from doing a lot with that data for the protection of student privacy. We have agreements with individual institutions, um, but I would love to facilitate that kind of relationship 
uh, if possible. We just need willing partners and, and big ideas. And, and I certainly would be the guy to at least start the conversation with. Other questions? Okay, I think that's it then. We've exhausted the questions. Thank you guys so much for inviting me today. It was a lot of fun to be out here.